Welcome to Castlefields Church. Welcome if you're a regular. Uh, welcome if uh, you are joining us for the first time. Right since the beginning of the year, we've been uh, hearing messages about uh, the events in the Book of Acts. Right at the beginning, we issued uh, some notes uh, to introduce our uh, series. Uh, those notes are on the website in the notes and articles page for you to have uh, a look at. They introduced for us this book of action, uh, this book which tells us of the early days in uh, the church in the New Testament. The mission on which the Lord Jesus Christ has sent his disciples, he sent them then and he continues to send us now as Christian believers. We've called this series Mission Unstoppable. I've set you the task of, uh, of reading through uh, the passages that we, we look at and getting to grips with where we are, perhaps looking at a map and going through uh, each verse. Uh, and my task has been, uh, for each passage that we look at, to draw out the application so that in this mission that we see here, uh, in these pages, what does it have to say to us on mission today at Castlefields Church? We can't go through every verse and every detail, but with God's help, we want to seek to apply God's word so that we might know how we might serve him in these days. Along the pattern that was set in those early days in the church. To help you, if you have young children, there are some uh, notes for the young ones, an activity for them to do each week. Uh, and that's been sent out. That's on the website for you. Uh, and that's along with uh, some hymns which are there for you to use in worship too. For those who are regulars with us, then we send those things out on what we call the C News, uh, a circular. Well, I'm going to begin in prayer. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, our great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're able to come into your presence today to say, Our Father, you are in heaven. Lord, we come to hallow your name because it is so wonderful and glorious and you are such a mighty God. And though, Lord, you are eternal and transcendent and great and glorious, yet, Lord, as your children, we can come to you and say, Abba, Father, what a wonder is this. We thank you for the relationship that we have as Christian believers with you through the Lord Jesus Christ. That though, yes, you are in heaven, yet you are as near to us as an earthly father, close to us, caring for us. You are the good shepherd. You are our guide and our help in life. And you have sent your son to be our saviour so that we might, through him, come into a relationship with you where we are sons and daughters of the living God, justified and brought through adoption to be joined to the Lord Jesus so that we might come and call you our Heavenly Father. Thank you for this great and wonderful privilege we have. Please accept our thanks and our praise again this day as we come to you. And please, Lord, today guide us again into all truth. We thank you for the Lord Jesus and his great prayer where he prayed, sanctify them through your word. Your word is truth. And we have opened before us your word so that we might be blessed and helped and built up in our faith. So be with us this morning, uh, Lord, whoever we are. If we do not know you personally, if we can't say that we have really come into a relationship with you, then this morning, please, we pray, may that be the case for the first time, so that we might know the joy of believing and knowing the Lord Jesus as our Saviour. Help us then, Lord, in all we do, we pray. For we commit ourselves to you and ask you again that you would forgive us all our sins, cleanse us from all our unrighteousness 
And we thank you for your promise to do that in the Lord Jesus. We thank you for his effective work upon the cross. For that great statement, it is finished. The work is done and completed. Lord, we thank you that we cannot bring anything to you. Remind us of that, we pray this morning. And help us to accept everything that you have done and bring to us. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The hymns we've sent out, and they're on the website. There's one for the beginning of the service and one for the end. A great hymn of praise at the beginning. Jesus, the name, high over all. So please sing that uh, or read it through. Pause the recording for a moment to do that. Now I'm going to hand over to Richard. Richard's going to talk to the children this morning and then he's going to read for us. So I hope you have a Bible you can look at and he's going to read from Acts chapter 16. He's going to read verses 16 through to verse 40. Thank you, Richard. Morning, boys and girls. Welcome to the visual children's talk today. So I want to talk to you this morning about light. We live in a world where there's light and the Bible tells us about light as well. And I want to explore that with you a little bit this morning. I have some pictures for you. Let me just bring those up now so you can see them. I hope you enjoy them. Let's just have a, a look at those. So when I was younger, quite a lot younger, actually, probably around Stanley's age, I did used to be that old once. I used to enjoy doing something that involved looking at this. What is it? Of course, it's the moon, isn't it? It's the moon that goes around the Earth. And the moon is very special. I used to love looking through a telescope, looking at the different parts of the moon, and just enjoying the experience of looking at the heavens, looking at the stars too. Now, what does the moon do at night? Well, the moon shines, doesn't it? It, it gives light. Sometimes Henry and I will go for a bit of a, a walk in an evening, maybe a Sunday evening later on, a bit of a chat. And sometimes we'll go down a country lane or a, a cycle track. And uh, what we find is that it's never, even though there's no street lights, it's never totally dark. Do you know why? Because the light shining from the moon lights up the pathway and shows us the way to go. But the moon, do you know the moon doesn't actually have its own light? The moon gets its light from somewhere else. Where do you think it is? Where does the moon get its light from? Well, the moon gets its light from, of course, the sun. The sun is a star and the sun shines light throughout this solar system and shines its light and its heat across all the planets, including a planet Earth. I wonder if you know the names of some of these planets. Can you say them with me? Would you be able to know them? The first one, the one that's closest to the sun, is called Mercury. Then it's Venus. Then Earth, or our planet. Then Mars. Then Jupiter. I always remember Jupiter because of the red spot, which is actually a storm, a cloud storm on the planet. Everybody knows Saturn because Saturn's the one with rings around it, of course, beautiful, beautifully looking. Then, of course, we have Neptune, then Uranus, and then Pluto. The planets in our solar system, the sun is at the center, giving its light, radiating its light to them, just like it does to the moon. And we see the moon it at night. You know the names of the planets? Uh, they've been around for thousands of years. They were named by the Romans and the Greeks after their gods. You know, the God of the Bible created all of these planets. He created the sun. He's so powerful and so amazing. He gives the sun its light. He gives the sun its energy. He gives the sun its warmth. In the beginning, the Bible tells us God created the heavens and the earth. So what do we have? by having the sun? Well, two things, at least two things. First is this, we have light. We have light. Can you imagine if the sun 
disappeared. What would it be like? Well, it would be like darkness all the time. You know what it's like on a winter morning when you wake up and it's dark and it's cold. You open the curtains and it's dark. Thankfully, it's not like that at this time of year. But when it does, it, it, it's like that. But always in winter, the sun begins to shine as it throughout the day it becomes light, doesn't it? And we get some warmth from the sun. But you know what it's like if there were, if there were no sun? It would be like darkness all the time. It would be like winter all the time. It would be awful. It would be horrible. Can you imagine going on holiday? Should we go on the beach? What, in the dark? Making sandcastles in the dark? Or walking up on hills in the dark? No, it would be horrible, wouldn't it, if there were no sun? There would be no light. Would you go and play in the garden in the dark? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't do that. What else does the sun do? Well, it keeps us warm, doesn't it? Well, Friday, what a warm day that was. I'm sure it was shorts and t-shirt weather. Maybe you had a paddling pool in the garden. Who knows? It was a day for sun cream, wasn't it? To protect us from the sun. We get that warmth and the beauty of the warmth from the sun as well. And the sun is very, very powerful. The light from the sun is very powerful. Do you know that? This man knew that. Who is this guy? This guy is Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton, a famous scientist. He's the guy who discovered gravity. Do you remember when the apple fell and he discovered it? He said, apple falls to the ground, gravity pulls things. This is the man who's a scientist. He liked to explore things. And one day he had a crazy idea. He said, what would happen if I stared at the sun? Do you know what happened? Yeah, he went blind. He went blind, thankfully, only for a couple of days, but he went blind. Very sad, but thankfully he recovered. Isaac Newton said, do you know what? God is so amazing. I believe in God for many reasons, but one of them is that God has made the earth just in the right place, close enough for its light and warmth, but not too far away or it get cold and dark. God is amazing. God is amazing. Do you know what would happen to the earth? If the sun disappeared, we thought about it a bit, haven't we? It would be dark. But it would eventually, the earth would freeze. You see how our earth now is green and there's trees and plants and life and animals and humans that God has made and in the sea, there's fish and so on. It's beautifully blue. But if the sun disappeared, then we'd none of that. It would be cold and dark and freeze. It would be a horrible place to be. Well, Jesus talks about light in the Bible. Jesus talks about himself. He said these words. He said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus says, he is the light, just like the sun shines into our world with its warmth and its light. And we love it and it lights and gives life. Jesus is the one who can bring life and light into this dark, dead, sinful world that the Bible tells us about. You know, the Bible says that our hearts uh, have been affected by sin. They're spoiled because of sin. We can do bad things. We can say bad things. We can do bad things to our brothers or sisters or friends or be rude or impolite and these are these are dark things but jesus came as the light of the world to take away that darkness and he did it by dying on the cross we remember that at easter don't we jesus came as the light of the world he came from heaven he came to earth to show us the way back to heaven and it's only through him he said, I am the light. There aren't many different lights. There are many different ways. Jesus says, it's me. He who trusts me, the boy or girl who trusts me and follows me, they won't walk in darkness. They will have the light of life. They'll know what it is to have my joy in their heart and my comfort and my presence and to know what it is to be in heaven with me in the light forever. I am the light of the world, Jesus says. Is he your light? Are you trusting him? Are you following Jesus? May it be so. Amen. Let's pray. 
Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you that he is the light of the world. Help us to trust in him. Help us to follow hard after him all the days of our lives. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read to you now from God's word from Acts chapter 16. And beginning the reading at verse 16. Acts 16, verse 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high gods who proclaimed to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, but Paul greatly annoyed turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace and to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews are exceedingly troubling our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, seeing the prison doors again, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword, and he was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same night, same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. When he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the officers saying, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans and have thrown us into prison. And now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and they pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they entered the house of the prison. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Amen. Thank you Richard uh, for that. Let's turn to that passage that has been read for us in Acts chapter 16 and as we come to it let's just pray together shall we. Lord we come to you from different backgrounds, different situations in our lives, we're different ages Our understanding of your word is different. But Lord, we pray this morning by the wonder of your Holy Spirit's operation 
that uh, what we hear and what we see in your word might come into our hearts and lives and speak to us and change us. And may we put down this day, listening to this message, as being a very special day in our lives when we met with you and you met with us. Lord, please do that, we pray, because we ask it for your glory and we ask it for our good. In Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder what you think is the most important question that you might be asked or the most important question that anyone could ask. Uh, for some, it, it's just simply this. What's your name? Or maybe, how are you? Uh, for some, a very important question is, will you marry me? Or did I pass? Of course, there are more philosophical and deeper questions, aren't there? Is there a God? What, what's the world here for? What's life all about? Life's full of questions, isn't it? We ask questions all the while, don't we? What's the time? Uh, who phoned today? Has the post come? How do I do this? Oh, where are you off to today? Questions all day long, aren't there? But this morning I want us to consider what I believe is the, the most important question, the biggest question that anyone could ever ask. Man or woman, boy or girl, whoever we are. And we're going to find out what that question is and we're going to find out what the answer is to that question. So not only this morning the most important question that you'll ever ask, but the most important answer you'll ever receive. But we need just to set the scene for a moment. So in the passage we've read together, let's just remind ourselves it's, it's about AD 51. Uh, a number of missionaries are in Europe for the first time. Uh, who are they? Well, we know in Acts chapter 16 and verse 3 onwards, it was Paul, the Apostle Paul, and, and Silas is with him, and they picked up Timothy along the way in Lystra. Uh, so three of them. But when you uh, look at the uh, narrative, you'll find that the writer is now saying us and we. Uh, verse 10, verse 11, verse 12, and so on. So who's joined them? Well, it's Luke. Luke is the writer. Luke, the inspired historian, the inspired storyteller, the inspired travel writer, now is the inspired personal witness of all the events that happen, and he's writing these things down for us. Now, in all those things, Luke can't write everything. He can't tell us everything. He, he's writing for his friend Theophilus, telling him about the uh, the way the church has begun in those early centuries. But he's writing for us too. This is the inspired word of God. And what he's telling us is there are a number of days, there was a period of time in the city of Philippi, verse 12, he says, some days. Some time it appears that they stayed in the house of this lady, uh, Lydia, we, we don't know. He tells us in verse 16 onwards about them going out from Lydia's house down to the place of prayer. And uh, how many days it was, he, he doesn't say. The spirit possessed a slave girl at some stage, joins them each day, it seems, and shouts out uh, about these men. And in verse 18, he tells us it's many days. But we know that two things have happened, at least during that time. If you look at right at the end, uh, first of all, we find that a church has been started in Philippi. So in verse 40, um, they go and visit the brethren. They go to meet with the brethren. Uh, the original word is men and women. Lydia owns a large house uh, and there's seemingly a gathering there in that house. It's a beginnings of a church. And it's a church that the Apostle Paul would write to, maybe 10 or so years later, the church in Philippi. Paul, by that time, is in prison and he's writing to that church. And, you know, it's a church that always makes him smile. 
It's a church that gives him so much joy. Uh, you can read the epistle to the Philippians. It's a bit further on after the book of Acts. Let me just read what it says in Philippians 1 verse 3. Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always and in every prayer of mine, making a request for you all with joy. And one of the reasons I am sure that he looks back those 10 years or so to that time is that he can never forget that night. He can never forget that question, that important question, the biggest question in the world. And you can never forget the answer that he gave to that question. Well, I would imagine he probably winced as well because he remembered the other events that led up to that question, the very painful events. We've read them through, haven't we? As they go out to the place of prayer each day, there is this slave girl shouting out. Um, she seems to be demon possessed uh, and a poor girl in a terrible state. Uh, we read that in verse 17. I'll just look at, down at the verses with me. Verse 18, Paul rebukes that demon that pos possessed her. Uh, because of the attention that she kept drawing to their presence in the city. Look at verse 19. Her, her masters, who cruelly and cynically used this poor girl, uh, then sort of mugged Paul and Silas and dragged them off into the marketplace, into the forum, because their means of income are now gone. Well, verses 22 to 24, we find that Paul and Silas are both stripped and and beaten and they're thrown into the inner prison. Luke's watching this. Uh, he doesn't get uh, into that situation, <laughs> probably very thankfully. And Timothy, he's, he must be there somewhere else watching on to these things. This is Philippi. And Philippi is meant to be an outpost of Rome. It's meant to be a mini Rome. That was sort of its nickname, really. And Roman law and justice was supposed to take place in this outpost of great Rome. But it didn't really prevail, did it, until right at the end of the story. And Luke records that then and only then Paul uh, is able to convince the authorities, at least to tell them he's a Roman heritage. And so is Silas, his friend. Well, that set the rabbits running. You can see that in verses 35 uh, to 39. Red faces all round with the magistrates and the officers. And Paul stands his ground. They should never have beaten him, put him in prison like they did. He says, let them come and let us out. Let them come and themselves get us out of prison. But one face that Paul always remembers and in his mind's eye when he thinks of Philippi, even with all those events, is the face of that jailer in the light of that flickering torch that night. And that question, that urgent, ringing, serious question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's the big question. That's the most important question that you or I or any man or woman or boy or girl could ever ask. What is it that brings any one of us to ask that question? Well, let's find out because I want to focus the rest of our time upon the events that unfold in verses 25 to 34. We mentioned that introduction to the book of Acts at the beginning of this service. And one of those Bible commentators that we mentioned is a man called uh, Dr. Richard Lenski. And this is what he writes. He says here in these verses, 25 to 34, here we have the most astounding piece of mission work recorded in Acts. It is done in the small hours of the night for the jailer and his family by the jailer's prisoners. And what I want to suggest to you is that like the jailer in Philippi, 
what will bring you to ask seriously this question of four things? I want you to notice awareness. Secondly, events. Thirdly, fear. And fourthly, need. We see all those things in this narrative. And I think as we go through, you'll see all those things are somewhere in our experience. If we have already, or if we do, ask this question. So here's the first thing. Awareness, awareness. Awareness of God. Perhaps first, an awareness just of the reality of God, when we don't normally think about God. But somehow, like this jailer, somehow now you, you're thinking of God. You wouldn't normally do that. What brought this jailer to an awareness of God? Well, Philippi was a significant city in AD 51, but really it was only the size of a, of a, a, a smallish town uh, in Britain today. So things were would be uh, known throughout the whole town, even though there wasn't the internet and TV and so on. Philippi was dominated by two things. Number one, it's pagan worship. Archaeologists have discovered uh, in the Agora, the, the forum, the marketplace, that's referred to in verse 19, uh, they've discovered there uh, more than 180 rock carvings. And 80 of those, or more than 80 of those, are of the goddess Diana. It indicates to us that uh, pagan worship was very much the case in this city at that time. And look at verse 16 and what it tells us about this poor girl, this demon-possessed girl. This culture of fortune telling and mystical pagan rites and, and practices, along with all the corruption that that brings. So the first thing that characterized Philippi was its pagan worship. But the second thing we sort of alluded to is its desire to be like Rome. Can you look at verse 21? When Paul and Silas are, are bundled into the, into the marketplace, the great cry goes up. These people are disturbing our city and we're Romans. You see, they had this view that they were like a mini run. Uh, we see, we've mentioned there's magistrates and there's, there's officers in, in, in the story. Uh, and we see how that works out towards the end of the story, verses 35 to 39. So here's pagan worship and Here's the desire to be Roman. And this jailer was just part of really all that. When Paul and his colleagues arrived in the city, when the events of verses 20 to 24 all happen, it's not the Christian gospel, not yet, that uh, affects things and changes things and comes to everyone's notice. It's the fact that they are Jews. You see, this demon-possessed girl is crying out, isn't she? They're the servants of the Most High God. Oh, yes, they've come to tell the way of salvation, but that's the thing, the Most High God. The devil knows about the Most High God. We see on a number of occasions in the scriptures uh, how those who are demon-possessed, uh, the demons cry out their knowledge of God. They certainly are aware of God. But in a strange way, it brought an awareness of God into that pagan Roman city. But the thing that annoyed those who held this girl captive was that they were Jews. Now, later on in Acts chapter 18 and verse 2, we're going to be told something about contemporary history. We're going to be told that Claudius Caesar has expelled all the Jews from Rome. They're all thrown out of the city. 
And this is Philippi, this is mini Rome. So they didn't want Jews there. Jews were not welcome in this city. We notice that Paul can't go to a synagogue in Philippi, as he has done in his past journeys. You see, this city didn't have an awareness of God until these men came and brought that awareness. And this jailer is part of that city and its environment and how it all works. And he becomes aware of all these things. By word of mouth, it's spread around. It's highly likely that this jailer would have been at least aware of all this talk of the most high God. He didn't think about God normally. Of course, when they bundled Paul and Silas into the prison and he was responsible for them, it's almost as if God had come in with them. There's an increasing awareness of God with this man. Now, I don't know how it is with you. Maybe in the past, you've never really sort of thought about God at all. But something has triggered that thought. What if there is a God? What is he like? Who is he? And maybe more recently, you've begun to think about God. That there's become in your life an awareness of God. Now let's move to the second thing, because what happens here is events. Awareness was our first thing. Events, the second thing. Because it's the events that happen that really bring this man face to face with his need of a relationship with God. You see, that awareness, though perhaps vague and sort of out there, now is very much, as we can see from the story, in here, right in the prison of which he is responsible for. Who could have predicted what was going to happen? Christians praying and singing praises in the stocks, despite the beatings, despite the darkness and the horror of that place. The little thing that the children have got to do this morning includes some pictures of some rats running around in the prison. Never before had things like this happened. Never had this man ever heard the singing of the praises of God, of men praying to the Most High God. You see, the events are moving things on in his awareness. And then there's this tremendous earthquake and the doors flying open and the chains falling off. And the horror for him as he comes in after that earthquake of what would happen to him if the prisoners escaped. There was a protocol, you see, in Rome, being Roman, a mini Rome, that if he, as the prison jailer, allowed the prisoners to escape, then he would suffer the fate that the prisoners would have suffered. He drew his sword. Suicide seemed to be the only way out if that was going to be the case. But this man, Paul, he cried out, do yourself no harm. We're, we're all here. And the man's on his knees. He's on his knees before the prisoners. That, that had never happened before. Prisoners are meant to be on their knees before him. You see, God was using these events. God was using things that were happening all around him to lead this man to this great question. And in the events is the third thing, the third aspect, fear, fear. Verse 29, can you see there it's a trembling fear. What's he afraid of? Well, it's not the fear for his own life and freedom. The prisoners were all there. Paul says that, verse 28. It's not a fear of the Roman consequences of the prisoners all fleeing. It's not Roman judgment that he's fearing. It's not the fear of the earthquake 
although that must have made him and all the others very fearful, because all was silent now. No, this is a fear of God. This is a fear of the future without God. This is a fear of meeting the Most High God that he's had an awareness of, that these men have been singing of. This is a God above Diana. This is a God above useless idols and pagan deities. And his fear is of divine judgment. What will happen to him if he meets this God? You know, it's the same fear that that thief had on the cross. The one that cried out to the Lord Jesus. Do you remember what he said to that other thief? You can look it up in Luke chapter 3 and verse 40. He shouted out to that other thief on the other side of the Lord Jesus. Do you not even fear God, seeing you're under the same condemnation? You see, both men knew they were criminals. They were under Roman condemnation and justice. Or well, they were shouting out their blasphemies and uh, their curses. But this one man, the awareness of God grew stronger and his fear grew as he realized that he was not only under Roman condemnation justly for his crimes, but he was under the condemnation of God. And he began to fear that. And he cried out to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, the kingdom of the one who is going to be my judge. You see, that fear gripped him. And the same fear grips this Philippian jailer this night in Philippi. He could see these things and he was afraid too. There are all sorts of things that uh, make us fear, aren't they? COVID-19, that makes us fear. What if I get it? What if I die? And this terrible explosion in Beirut, we saw the devastation of that. People just in a second blasted into eternity. What if I'd been there? What if that had happened to me? And it makes us fear. And maybe in your life, there's that awareness of God that's come in somehow. Maybe you know Christians. Maybe you're around sort of Christians, Christians in your family. And it's a bit like having Paul and Silas in the prison. And you started to think about God. And thinking about God actually makes you fear, makes you wonder. Well, the next thing we see is need, is need. This fear, this fear brings this man to a need, a desperate, urgent need. The dying thief cried out, didn't he? Lord, remember me. And the jailer on his knees could see it just as clearly. And from his need comes this great question what must i do to be saved here is a sinner on his knees here's the question on his lips and here is his heart as well as his ears open to hear the answer you see an awareness of god the events of life the growing fear of God and a sense of need, they bring us to ask the question. So I wonder if that's your case. I wonder if that's where you are, that somehow the vivid account that's before us resonates in your life. So are you ready to hear what the answer is to that question? The answer that will change your life. Like it changed the life of this man, not just now, but for eternity. And here's the answer. Can you see in verse 31 what it is? What must I do to be saved? 
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And Paul says, not only you, but your house. In other words, anyone else, anyone else who similarly comes to this position and humbles themselves and asks that same question. Anyone can be saved. But what about you? That Bible commentator, Richard Lenski, this is what he writes. He says this. Here we have the gospel in a nutshell. It's quintessence expressed in the simplest of forms. Faith, Jesus and salvation. Let's just consider those things just for a moment as we bring these things together. This is the essential of the gospel, of the good news that answers that question. Faith, faith. This man asked, what shall I do? All other gods that he knew about, those pagan gods, the goddess Diana and all that that entailed, all required you to do something. Be someone, go somewhere, give something. But the answer that he gets here is simply this. Believe, believe. The Apostle Paul wrote not only a letter to the Philippine church, but he wrote a letter to the Ephesian church. And he wrote to Christians in Ephesus. Those who'd asked this question had heard the answer to it. And he explains to them really what happens in belief. Let me just read it to you. You can look it up. Ephesians 2 and verses 1 to 10. It's quite a few verses here, but it's so important to hear this. This whole matter of faith. And you, he says, he, God, has made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, just as others, everyone else. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Listen to this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Just faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith alone. Not bringing anything. Not going anywhere. Not being someone. Not giving something. We've got nothing to give. It's through faith in what God gives. That's grace. Faith alone by grace alone. But faith must have an object. You can't just have faith, can you? I've got faith. No, no, no. Faith must be in something, mustn't it? Or in someone in this case. And that's the second thing here. Faith. The nub of the gospel, faith. But in Jesus. Faith alone. In Christ alone. And there's that wonderful hymn that we sing. I can't put it any better than this. Listen to these words. Probably the best hymn that's been written in recent years. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, 
fullness of God in helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. But not just in the death of Christ, listen to this verse. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. You see, faith is a gift of God. We receive it as we look to the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect man who was born and lived that perfect life for us and died upon that cross and suffered the wrath and just punishment of God in our place that we might go free. And that's the third word, salvation, salvation. This jailer wasn't looking for physical or temporal salvation, was he? When he said, what must I do to be saved? He wasn't thinking about salvation from the lynching of the prisoners. He wasn't thinking about salvation from the Roman consequences of all the prisoners escaping because they were all there. In fact, he was likely to be applauded, maybe given an award for the fact that the prisoners didn't escape not lost any of them even in the earthquake no when he asked for salvation he was talking about salvation from sin he was talking about his eternal safety and security he was talking about a safe haven from judgment to come he was talking about this most high god that these men represented that knew personally And he heard them say this, you will be saved. There was a certainty about this. There was no certainty in any pagan religion, no certainty about being a Roman citizen, about the future, about eternity. But with this salvation, there's certainty. You will be saved. A permanent and secure salvation. And it's a salvation that changes things. It certainly changed this man, didn't it? Can you see what happened here in verse 32? He demonstrated by being baptized that he'd been saved. He'd heard that answer. He'd placed his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Because baptism is going down into that water, as it were, being buried and washed and coming out clean and new. The picture of baptism demonstrates his salvation. And not only that, but his salvation is evidenced as well. Look at what he does in verses 32, 33 and 34. There's the evidence of kindness that he shows now to these men who once were his prisoners. And now he's, he's bathing their wounds and he's offering them food and he's showing a love and a kindness to them. And then also in verse 34, there's a rejoicing. Others have come to know the Saviour too in his household. We're not told whether it was his wife and his children, some of his servants, whoever it was, but they'd all come to listen to this message. And it wasn't just a blind emotional response from this man in his terror. No, 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 not at all. Look at verse 32. It tells us that Paul and Silas, they sat down and they spoke the word of God to this man and to his family and to his servants. This was a logical, reasonable, explainable faith. Christianity is not a, just a panic measure, not just a crutch. It's a faith and a trust in a logical and reasonable and explainable saviour. 
who came to save us from our sin. From a book which is logical and reasonable and explainable, which we call now the Bible, and it includes this account. And what a joyful, wonderful scene there is in verse 34. Look at that scene. Think of it. What devastation in the prison. What joy in that house. Well, I wonder, have you asked yet the most important question in the world? Have you heard the answer? The most important answer in the world. Have you believed? Are you rejoicing? Is there evidence in your life that things have changed? Is all your trust in this reasonable, explainable and logical gospel in the word of God? You know, it's my prayer that someone listening today, maybe you, with this growing awareness of God that somehow come into your life and all the events that are happening in your life and the fear of death and judgment and meeting God that perhaps you know will bring you to that position of need. Because without that, we're never going to ask this question. We're going to think we can make it through life and somehow we're good enough. But when we see our need, we'll say this, what must I do to be saved? And we'll be ready to take that step of belief. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's the most important question you could ever ask. It's the most important answer that you'll ever get. I'd love us to sing to close the, all of that hymn that we mentioned in Christ alone. Uh, and if you can't sing it and if you don't know the tune, um, then please read it through and just pray that it might be your testimony. Lord, as we close this service, we ask that your word may be effective in our hearts. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us now and for eternity because of that certain salvation which is in Jesus Christ, in Christ alone. Amen.